All right. Welcome everybody to this week's or yeah, this week's Parker Office Hours. I mean it's bi-weekly, but um here we are. Um and uh, as always, be excellent to each other, um, follow the code of conduct. And with that out of the way, we have exciting things to show today. And I think the first demo, um, yeah, given yesterday's blog post, is going to be also very cool. Um, is by Javier, and he wants to show us continuous profiling system-wide, which is super excited. So yeah, take it away. Hello. So yeah, first maybe we can talk a little bit about it, and that will give me time to actually run Parka and Parka Agent and get something running. Um, so yeah, uh, basically the architecture that Parka uh, Agent had um, until now was that we were querying Kubernetes uh, for the available uh, pods, and for either every single of these pods, we're getting the uh, the uh, C group. And for those of you that know what C groups are. They're basically a, a way that Linux has to isolate resources within a machine. So uh, C groups plus namespaces are the two main things that are used for containers. And um, uh, the problem that this had is that we were not able to profile workloads that were outside of Kubernetes. And also, it made it a bit awkward, for example, to test or to run Parka Agent for like a one-off queries because it will force you to basically run your binary under, uh, for example, a container using Docker or Podman or even running Kubernetes. I know some people were testing things running um, full-blown Kubernetes. Um, so yeah, that's not ideal, right? So in, in this uh, re-architecture, what we have done is that we have uh, one single profiler instead of one profiler per, per C group. And, and then once we, we run like a profiling session, like every, I think, 10 or 20 seconds, we collect all the stacks, and then we we have to find uh, for these process IDs uh, what is the metadata that we can gather from systems such as Kubernetes, right? So now we have these two systems running concurrently. We have the discovery mechanisms that um, basically generate a mapping of process ID to um, metadata, like for example, in the case of Kubernetes, uh, pod names and similar things. And, and then all these will be uh, collated together into one profile that will be sent to to Parka and you'll be able to query it as before. Um, so we did this before because of um, a couple of reasons. The most important one is that we want to be able to profile other, other processes. We didn't want to be contained to containers. Um, but uh, we also wanted to um, ensure that the system will be more performant uh, than, than it was right now, because right now we had to spawn one profiler with all the data structures that it has, all the, uh, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm getting that call right now. Sorry about this. Let me quickly. Um... Don't worry, we can't hear it. If <laughs> cool, sorry about this. No so um, yeah, so basically, um, before we had to create um, one of these CPU profilers per C group, and now we only create one, which has multiple advantages. Uh, all these data structures for bootkeeping, bookkeeping, and other. Um, just to be able to run them that we had to run uh, before. We only have to have one in memory, but also we don't have to put pressure on, on the Linux kernel because when you use more uh, performance uh, monitoring units than that the machine has, that the CPU has, the kernel will have to basically multiplex among them. And it will, not only will lower the resolution, but it will also make the kernel have to do more work. So these are some of the reasons why we have done this work. And um, yeah, I can try to, uh, well, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I mean, well, I will, I will run a park agent. <laughs> By the way, there's a more detail and probably explain way better uh, on the blog post if you're interested. I will send it to this chat as well. I think it's also on the Google Docs, but just to make it easier. Um, in the meantime, I can share share the blog post with the oh, people. Sure. So yeah, I think we can we can drop it in chat and we'll have it in the meeting notes. We'll put it in YouTube descriptions so you can find it everywhere. Um, but yeah, it was it was a really I'm I'm gonna talk and you can figure out how to run Parker Agent in the meantime. Um, yeah, it was a, a very well written, um, yeah, 
rundown of of kind of like the, the previous architecture and the limitations that Javier also just like touched on, um, kind of going into into all the the details on on how it kind of like the way it was in uh, kind of like architected. It was nice because it was like in a in a like Kubernetes kind of metadata first approach. But yeah, like as as Javier also said, like it came down to to doing a bunch of like uh, mappings and the overhead was was quite significant so yeah the benefits of the new design and more simplicity reliability um but yeah i think there there are still some some things to to figure out but overall i think it's looking good um as far as i know and from the internal demos i've seen um and super excited for for the future but yeah take a look at the the pull requests that are linked in the blog post um, for example, those are, are kind of interesting as well. Um, and yeah, if you are generally speaking interested in, in eBPF, I think this is also a really great resource in, into learning about how to use eBPF and build something on top of it. Definitely. Uh, I wanted to mention that, uh, yeah, this is not, I'm not sure if you said it, Matthias, that this is not fully released. So if you would like to try it out, it's on, on, the, on the main branch. Uh, but I hopefully it should make it for uh, the next release. Uh, so yeah, you can you can try the main uh, main branch and kind of like build it from there. I think we do have Docker containers uh, built from the main branch, so it mm -hmm. should be in Docker containers uh, built from the main branch. You can give it a try, and then um, we also have this uh, GitHub discussion where you can always come and and give feedback. Um, just random things you encounter while while using the system wide profiling um, technique now. Yeah, how, exactly. How are we doing? <laughs> uh, working on it, working on it. Uh, and right. yeah, uh, just just to give you some context, me while I do it. Um, I think I must have a very old version of of Parka, so I'm uh, compiling and refreshing and compiling the uh, you know the JavaScript part of it, like you know generating the uh, well, download on the package all the packages and uh, building whatever it's building takes quite a bit of time so yeah but um yeah i wanted to also say that one of the things that we we haven't mentioned before that uh, should hopefully make things easier for um some of our users is that um before because we were attaching all these profilers to a c group we had to find the path where the c group basically is located because uh, you pass a file descriptor of that file to uh, some component, uh, some system call, and then it will it will basically attach it to it. And the problem is that even though it sounds really simple, right? It's like, okay, there's a file, you open it, what's a big deal? The problem is that every single Linux distribution uh, has this file in a different place. And uh, while we had some heuristics uh, to try to find where was the file located on your system, there's some Linux distributions that are really funky and they Put it in completely different places so not having to account for this um, is great because it's going to ensure that uh, things work for people that use distributions that are you know less common and potentially less tested than let's say ubuntu and fedora which i think they're probably like debian based and you know fedora based or centos based i don't know um so that's kind of another another of the benefits that i'm personally excited about because uh yeah the, the c group paths are a very interesting thing. Are you still compiling, Parga? Yeah, it's still okay. compiling. Because, yeah, like, yeah. if I mean, you you do have containers on your machine, you could just run a Dockerized Parka. Well, you're assuming that I have ever done that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, never done that before. Let me. Um, uh, it should be fine now. Let me see. So. Okay. I, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm run basically now I'm running Parka and uh, yeah the funny thing is that I didn't know that I was supposed to do a live demo so <laughs> that's why I'm so unprepared <laughs> but anyway it's really fine cool cool uh, yeah things are running now but I'm gonna let it run for a few more seconds until I get some samples that you know I can share. Maybe you can you can show how you kind of like start the Parka agent now, uh, sure, um, and, and how that looks. 
That's a good idea. Cherry. Yeah, sounds good. Um, cool. Um, let me share the yeah Visual Studio tab. I think it's this one. Cool. Cool. Can you can you see it? Uh, no, it's coming up. Yes. Yep. Yes. No, we can. Oh, awesome. So uh, yeah, well uh, the Parka we're running it like the usual way. Um, I run it like directly. I don't I don't use containers here. Um, so yes, in Parka um, after running make, so quite easy. And um, actually for Parka agent, thank you for saying this, Matthias, because things are a bit easier now. So I know if you can see it. Let me make it a bit bigger. But now the only thing we need to do is basically to build it and then to run Parka agent specifying a node name, uh, and then two things. Uh, the remote store address is the address where Parka is listening, so where we want to send the profiles. And then we have this other flag that is remote store insecure. Um, and we don't have to add anything else. Um, automatically, any Kubernetes kind of um, system that is running is going to query it and, and gather the containers from it. And if we want to. Oh, sorry. And also, it's asking system B uh, to list all the units that are running to basically get the name and add them as metadata. Uh, but either way, even if the metadata discovery phase doesn't work for some reason, or if you're not running Kubernetes, it won't really change much because the data is still going to be collected. You're still going to get CPU profiles, only that metadata is not going to be present. So, anyways, Parka Agent is not running. So, let me quickly see if I'm getting data. Okay. Okay, things are looking good. Oof. Okay, cool. Um, so let me uh, let me change uh, the screen. Uh, oh, cool. <laughs> awesome. Um, so yeah, as usual, um, well, I, I want to, let's go to profiles. And as usual here, uh, we are not using the scraping mode, right? We're using the uh, kind of collection mode where Parka agent is sending all these profiles to Parka. So we can select these here and then we can uh, hit search. And uh, we can see like, this is a thing in the UI that we probably have to improve after, after system-wide, but if, if we hover, we can see there's a bunch of data points there in multiple places. And we can see there's quite a bit of metadata. So for example, for this one, uh, there is um, the C group name there. And it says the executable name, which in this case is a uh, Go, uh, I don't know what the P stands for, but it's like language server. I don't know what, anyway. Go, please. But what, what is the P for? Like, please. But, okay, please. that's for the joke, okay. I thought it would be like go something language server. Anyways, um, so we can also see, um, for example, here, uh, this is another very cool feature that Kemal added uh, thanks to this new metadata system is that uh, if well, compilers uh, generate some metadata that they store in the uh, resulting binary, so now we can read these things as well and we add them as metadata. So, for example, here uh, we have something that with this PID and uh, we know that it was compiled with GCC 831, which is great, right? Because imagine, for example, that you switch compilers and you have uh, profiling data from before and after, and then you can see like how performance has changed. When the other thing, that, the only thing that has changed was the compiler, right? Which is great. Um, but anyways, um, I usually, uh, when dealing with this data, just ch check with uh, all the profiles merged together. And in this case, it makes a lot of sense because of system-wide. Uh, so yeah, let's let's do merge and yeah, we get a like a pretty like holistic view of the system. I guess that one of the features that we will eventually add is uh, some separation between processes, so we can group by processes here. But the cool thing is that um, of course we can, for example, query by in this case compiler. So we can even see like the different uh, Go versions that are running on my system. So we can see, for example, I'm only interested in Go one eighteen for processes that are running on my box. So let's take a look at that, which is Parka, great. Uh, I guess we are quite outdated. Uh, let, let's check the um, 
the other ones out of curiosity. Um, let's check, for example, this one, which is the oldest, right? Yeah, 112. Uh, okay, 112. I don't really know what this could be. But anyways, it's interesting that we can filter by all these things that we didn't have before. Of course, um, now, because we also store the system D units, uh, we can also query by this. Um, so in this case, it's the system D names, uh, this is, sorry, the system, the unit names for these system D units. Uh, what are the things I can show you here? Sorry, let me refresh. Uh, and we can also see, for example, the executable and all the executables running. So uh, let's say, for example, I'm only interested in tail scale, which I use on my machine. So yeah, we can see the CPU profiles of tail scale. And, and of course, this is not um, that, um, well, actually, we, we removed this in the end. Sorry, I was I was thinking about the secret ID. But anyways, I don't think we have that anymore. But this kind of shows um, a little bit like how it is to have like like full system observability where you can basically later on drill down by the data. I think that the main idea we have here is to send as much data as we can and then like slice and dice. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's about it. Um, you can see, for example, something interesting is on my system. Uh, from the Go code, it seems that OK log, this is quite a bit of CPU, right? Um, so yeah, like, I will say quite typical, right? That OK log. Uh, oh, sorry, maybe. Oh no, my, my bad. This is not actually logging. This is this is something else. But anyways, um, it's very interesting that we can see the whole system. So yeah, um, I'm happy to show you anything else in the UI if you want to. But um, yeah, I think that covers. And some of the interesting new things. Just a side note, I, I love how just by um, accident both tail scale and go please were um, were shown here because I don't know if you saw on Twitter, but a couple of days ago, um, Brad Fitzpatrick from um, tail scale was like somebody somebody should be, should do some. Um, Profiling of Go, please. Um, and I was I actually replied that um, during testing I sometimes accidentally uh, pick it up, <laughs> so <laughs> we can now send them this video. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I think Go, please. I mean, I love it, and it works really, really, really fast. Uh, so it makes it makes me really happy as a as a Go uh, noob, right? But yeah, it uses quite a bit of CPU. I would say it's the process that uses the most CPU on my box. Yeah, it would be interesting. Maybe we can send the profiles to to the GoPlease developers. I'm not sure. Maybe is is he a GoPlease developer or or no? No, he worked on Tailscale. Oh okay. yeah. But I'm, should, I'm pretty should. sure the um, that if we you know collectively continuously profiled all of our machines and then instead of you know profiling server software, we kind of send them a merge profile of all of the profiling data of all of our machines. I think yeah. that'd be kind of cool. Actually, that sounds like an amazing blog post. <laughs> yeah, we should do that. We should do that. It will be, I would say that even with just five or six people, it will be more than representative enough uh, of the kind of workloads. Yeah. So yeah, as, as Matthias said, like there's a couple of things we, we want to continue working on here. Like For example, in the future, we'll add more metadata providers. Uh, we obviously need to update the uh, documentation because in many cases it still refers to uh, the previous way of operating. Uh, there's also um, well one of the cool things as well is that we have we have addressed um, a bunch of bugs. Some of them were present before, but they were not happening as often as they are with system wide. Uh, for more detail, um, they are written there in the blog post and and they have links to the to the pull requests. Most of them, if not all, they were all race conditions. Uh, so right now, we obviously generate way more data. Um, so the windows for race conditions are way tighter than they used to be before. Um, but yeah, this is good, because even if you were not interested in system-wide, uh, those bugs should be fixed. So. Incidentally, I actually checked um, why, like, I was curious why in our production environment we weren't seeing the race condition of the, like, PMUs. Um, <clears throat> and I think the reason is that um, 
GCP machines, whatever the hardware underneath is, must have a ridiculous amount of PMUs. And that's why we just weren't seeing it very often because the, the multiplexing was happening relatively rarely. I, that's just my assumption, right? I, I, like, I don't know for sure, but I think that's what happened. That's why we, I don't think, ever really noticed. You know, here and there we saw that something was off, but when I, when I tried it on a machine, for example, my development machine, you can very, very obviously see it. Yeah, for, for me, it was funny because uh, this is something that Matthias and Frederick and Sumera know. But uh, basically, my desktop PC, uh, I inherited two desktop PCs. So I had one that was from 2012, more or less. It was quite powerful, but not so much. And I recently uh, got from a friend another one that is from 2017, 18. And just with an eCPU, I could trigger these race conditions so much more. <laughs> Any questions from anyone else about this? Julian, I know you're running <laughs> Parker Agent. So I'm gonna yeah, I'm, I'm running the, the, yeah, I'm I'm trying the main branch right now. Uh, I think I'm meeting an issue with the the discovery, the service discovery either on the debug info. Yeah, I, I I don't know actually, but yeah, I'm 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 running on an issue right now. I will I will create a, a GitHub issue if I find out what it is. But yeah, basically right now the um, the agents are not able to discover something, and I don't know what is the something yet. <laughs> Feel free to also start the conversation on Discord, and we can yeah, troubleshoot sure. together. But yeah, otherwise, yeah, pretty excited about all these updates. Yeah, I'm just seeing the uh, uh, Julian reported yesterday uh, about the, the GTED functions. Maybe it's because the system already picks up some GTED languages and it doesn't find the format. So it's just complaining about the things you maybe don't want to provide. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the, the JIT, like the perf map errors, was more of a red herring more than anything else. I don't think that's actually the the problem there, I, I, I thought it was the issue at first because I was looking at the, the errors on the on the agent side, you know, in the in the UI, and the, the main thing that it was telling me that oh, I'm not able to find the perf map, but that yes, was yeah. actually not a problem for me because everything that I'm profiling right now is go binaries. Um, but but yeah, yeah. Um, on the web UI, it, it gives the, the error. The error, it just the, the one thing you see is just GTIP function not found. Yeah, and. Yeah, I was just doing the, the demo that Javier just did. I was doing it in parallel, just seeing how it works. And I see that I don't see the system deprocesses on my machine, so I don't know why. I've been, uh, my system is a bit exotic because it's Next OS, maybe not that popular. I don't know why it doesn't find systemd. Are you yeah, running it in a container, or are you running it directly on the machine? Directly on the machine. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly what uh, Javier did. I don't spark up directly on the machine. I did to do with uh, the same flags as, as, uh, as Javier. I don't yeah, see Yeah, that's, that's surprising. Yeah. So when when you say this thing about systemd, like uh, you don't see PID1 anywhere, or or is it that the stack traces are not, uh, they are not correct, or they, they are not symbolized? I trace CPID1. Let me see what they found. Uh, so I see system D in PID one. So I see system D in PID one, but I don't see any services. Like I know I have a Rust service called. Yeah, you you know, you should you should have like those like system D units, right? Mm. Yeah. I don't have any system D units label. So I think could, it doesn't find them. Could you perhaps uh, run? Let, let, let me find the um the 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 um, the the binary flag right now. But um, I think it's a well, typical like system D, system CTL, and then there's some flags to, to list uh, the units, and it's what we use internally to, to gather them, right? So let, let me quickly try to find it. 
And okay. if you could run it, that would be super useful. Um, also in deep mode, I'm seeing something that maybe is normal. Is saying this cover receiver channel was full, so we're trying next cycle. So I hope it retries properly. And it's not clear. But yeah, I'm getting a lot of the channel being full. Maybe it's just already as well. Yeah, could you please uh, run these commands? Uh, sorry, let me quickly make it pretty. Uh, yeah, so it, we, we use system CDL list units uh, with these flags. And I will send you the part of the source code where this is in case you want to take a look. Um, Yeah, there that it is. works. Uh, so at least, wait, I run it as my user. Let's root out some basic more things. Just as a side note, I think it would be useful if we didn't use system CTL as a binary. There's actually mm -hmm. a well maintained uh, package in Go um, to interact with system CTL. Yeah, like you're talking through DBAS directly or. Yeah, yeah. No, that that would be that would be nice. I think this was kind of, you know, first iteration sort of thing. But yeah, it makes sense to to not rely on the binary. Yeah, because of course, you know, uh, the parsing is a bit more brittle. And yeah. I also happen to know the folks who work on this, so um, whatever is really important. Cool, no? Yeah. I can try try to make them do some work if we need to need it. <laughs> oh, for the worth, I think I found my issue. Mm. It's a config issue. It's not a it's not a Barca problem. <laughs> Should be interesting to provide for the automatic time zone. The it's a little Ross program I wrote. I'd like to see what it what's inside. <laughs> I, I <laughs> that way. Yeah, I have like I always comes up as the fan control system D unit service that <laughs> I have on my computer. So I'm like super eager to finally profile my fan control binary. <laughs> yeah, it's very cool. It's very cool. I'm very excited. Uh, about it. This is such a Linux on the desktop thing to say, to be honest. You got me there, yeah. Yeah, are we still trying to debug something? Should we move on with the agenda? Any more questions? What do people want to do? I guess there are no more questions. I mean, we can always come back to, to this if people continue debugging on the site, which it looks like. Um, I think next on the agenda is Frederick, who wrote something about the call graph visualization. Um, you want to give us yes. an update? So this is just. Disclaimer, I, I didn't do this work, but I'm extremely excited about this work. Uh, so I'm kind of stepping in for Monica and uh, um, just kind of give, giving a very quick demo. And she's going to come back in uh, two weeks, I think, to talk a little bit more in depth about this. I just wanted to show because I think it's extremely cool. So some of you might be familiar with um, the call graph visualization in PCRAF. So essentially, um, you know, there are various ways that we can visualize profiling data. And flame graphs, while very popular, um, can only kind of show one aspect of uh, profiling data or, you know, a specific, like not, not, not every kind of situation. And in particular, uh, call graphs as opposed to flame graphs, they essentially have every function only once in the visualization and like the name says it's a graph right so like from the from a root um, it kind of has arrows to to the functions that are being called and uh, a situation where a call graph might be super interesting as opposed to a flame graph could be when you have lots of lots and lots of functions 
calling the same function. Um, and they're coming from different stack traces, essentially. And this is a situation that you wouldn't notice in a flame graph because they would be distinct stacks and they would be very small or you know potentially very small frames in the flame graph. Maybe you don't even see them. But in cumulative, they might actually make a really big difference. Um, and the call graph is much better at um, demonstrating that. So um, Monica has been working on implementing this um, visualization. And I just want to quickly show that off. Um, quick um, note. I, I think you can see my screen. Is that right? Just coming up. OK. Um, one note. Um, this is currently behind a front end feature flag. And the way that you uh, enable these is in the UI readme in Parka. So essentially, um, actually, I would need to have, we need to look it up as well. But essentially, when you open Parka, you once need to um, add this to the URL. And it will, whoops, that's disable. Um, of course, we would want to enable. Um, and that way, um, this feature is going to be enabled for your browser only. So this is something that is, that is stored in um, local storage um, in the browser. And uh, therefore, only, only you will see this. So um, that's very intentional right now, because there are definitely still performance layout problems. We still are iterating on this, but we did just wanted to kind of start to merge some of this work and iterate on it rather than keep it keep rebasing this giant piece of work. So essentially we can look whoops. Okay. <laughs> Retention just kicked in. Um, I've been running this park up for some time actually. So as usual, you know, we can see uh, we see our icicle graph. Um, and this is also something that's still work in progress because now that we don't only have icicle graphs and tables, um, we actually need to kind of redesign this, um, you know, picker of how we show visualizations. Um, that's also still work in progress, but we have some ideas. Uh, the point being, um, for now, you know, you can just hit this call graph to pull up that visualization. And as I was actually playing with this earlier, one thing that I noticed is that this call graph is actually upside down currently. So the roots are at the bottom. So here, for example, um, is, the, is the scrape loop. Um, and we can see how the scrape loop is writing data and so on. And the further we go down, obviously, the less um, uh, cumulative value there is. But ultimately, you know, further down, there could also be something with slightly higher um, cumulative value, as we can see over here and over here. Um, and this is kind of exactly because of what I what I said um, in regards to the call graph being able to demonstrate different situations. So yeah, I think this is uh, pretty exciting, and um, I think a, a valuable addition to. Um, troubleshooting different kinds of situations. I definitely sometimes like using this kind of visualization um, it, when I, when I, whenever I use PFROF. So um, I'm excited to getting this into, into Parka natively as well. And if you're familiar with the PFROF version, I also think it looks much prettier, prettier already. Um, but there's definitely a couple of elements that we will want to translate. So right now, the first thing that the team actually noted was um, people who are colorblind or you know red green uh, blind might not actually see a difference um, in this visualization right now. Um, so that's something that we want to work on. PPROF, for example, solved this by actually demonstrating um, values through size and color, um, and that way, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of person is looking at it. Um, they can they can still see the difference. Um, yeah, like I said, I just wanted to kind of show show this off that it you know works at kind of a minimum level already. Um, I think it's already cool that the kind of hover effects work on on all of this. 
Um, definitely something that I feel um, was kind of missing from from the graphvis from the from the pprof version because you always you didn't really know all the detail you could only see what graphvis happened to render into it uh, so definitely excited about being able to see more more detail i'll stop here and um, monica will will give us a much more in-depth walkthrough of this but if anyone has any questions um, i'd be happy to answer those as well Something, something interesting on the, the pprof side is that you, are, you will be able to see like the name of the function and the time spent directly. Like You look at the graph and you see, because this one is big, you're just going to look into it. Are we thinking about adding like more information on the dots directly? Yeah, definitely. I think we, we just wanted to, um, and it's great that you're saying this because we very, very intentionally started with the most minimal version possible to see what is it that people actually find useful from the pprof visualization. And it's funny that you say this because that was also uh, kind of the feedback when I when I saw it ver the very first time. Um, I think we'll play around with a couple of things. Um, maybe we will try to you know just show the package name or something like that to start. Yeah. Um, and only if you hover do you see the full information. Uh, the point point being, you know, we want to try to see if all of the directions that pprof happened to go in were were correct, or if there's some things that we can do um, better, maybe potentially more intuitive. So yeah, Beth, please please try it out and give us all all the, your thoughts, all your feedback, so that we can incorporate it. Or you know, if you're curious <laughs> about working on this, you definitely can as well. Yeah, that's nice. I think there is a ton of things to do on the visualization part of the data. Um, as I was looking at from a tweet, a tweet from one of the guys from Datadog, um, I, I, I learned about this Netflix tool called Flamscop, I think, Flamescop or something like that, where you can see, uh, like, instead of having, uh, you know, the 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 graph of your pprof, you have actually a heat map. And then you can select a range, and it's going to aggregate all the data. And so you are going to have the aggregated pprof for CPU time for all the function for a specific things that you have been selecting. Yeah, ton of things to do on the visualization side, for sure. Yeah, I think. Like at some hackathon, uh, there were already uh, interesting ideas of more visualizations. So we'll definitely want to stop there, I think. Um, I think more of a statement, but uh, also a question. I think the, f the call graph actually makes it easier to um, see recursive function calls as well, I think, because that's one of the major drawbacks I now found with the, with the flame graphs where like, for example, when you look at Parker itself, you often see a B tree insert um, where the uh, profiles are inserted. And then you see all these like insert calls of the B tree recursively at different levels and heights. And it kind of like, I think, I don't know if there's something we can do about the flame grass eventually as well, where we can say, okay, maybe collapse like all these um, um, recursive function calls. They aren't like really helpful in that sense. Um, but I think the, the call graph kind of like more nicely shows a recursive function calls a bit more clearly. So I'm I'm really looking forward to whenever I see that in a in a flame graph. Like I th I think like now I will start with a flame graph. Like a year ago I always started with a call graph. Now I always want to start with a flame graph. But then um, I'm I'm gonna like look at a call graph whenever there's something like like recursive function calls happening. I think that's that's pretty pretty amazing to have the option. Yeah, as I said, more of a statement. <laughs> the the tricky part about recursion is that recursion doesn't have to happen directly in the same function, right? Um, and so you don't really know at what point to collapse. And maybe more importantly, the collapsing is actually something the compiler should do by itself. This is this optimization is called uh, tail calls, um, 
And yeah, unfortunately, the Go compiler's stance on uh, tail recursion is that they don't want to implement it. Um, I don't remember if it was just a momentary thing or if it was more of an absolute thing. I don't know. A lot of the things in the Go compiler were always just no because the no is temporary and the yes is permanent. Um, so maybe one day. But yeah, definitely agree with that statement. Um, the, the one thing that we can do in FrostyB and Parka is actually collect the results of the B tree iterations and only then do it afterwards. Um, so that way we don't actually see all the remaining stacks under the B tree. Um, but we would essentially just see you know, the recursive calls in the B tree, if this is possible, right? Not, not necessarily every situation can do this. But essentially, we would be optimizing our code for observability. Um, yeah. Kind of not ideal, I would say, but it's a, it's an option that exists. Yeah. Yeah, I think the the tooling should handle that rather than the code. Because then you have one application that like is nicely <laughs> changed and the code was like modified, but not everybody benefits. Yeah. Um, all right. Any questions to the call graph? Um, it hasn't been, been set before. Otherwise, I think we don't have anything on the agenda. Um, anything people want to bring up, discuss? We still have like 15 minutes left. Um, I think we scheduled this for a full hour. Yeah, we did. So yeah, if there's something you want to discuss, feel free to. Or anything that came up with the system-wide profiling again, I think there were some some comments. <laughs> Hopefully we can we can resolve it offline as well. Nothing. Then I would say um, there are, again, pre-built containers for Parka uh, and for Parka agent for both main branches. So you can deploy these even in a containerized uh, fashion. And then you can start using system-wide profiling today. And please go to the. Um, GitHub discussion that uh, is also linked if you can't find it. Like it's linked in the blog post um, that Javier wrote and was published yesterday. You can find the GitHub discussion there. Um, and then also for this call graph, um, I think you said, Frederick, it's merged in, into main branch, right? I didn't look at the notifications. Just again. today, yes. Yeah. So it's merged. And again, the um, UI. Um, feature flag, this query parameter, um, should work on the main branch as well if you deploy that. Um, so yeah, I, th I think everybody um, can just go ahead and run these and, and, and give feedback. And we can all together make, make Parker more awesome, more cool, huh? pun intended. Um, and yeah, um, just hopefully make progress uh, in the open source spirit. If that's all, then we will see you in two weeks um, where we will get a full demo of an updated version of the call graph. And I hope that also we'll have some frost -B updates again. We are currently hard at work uh, with frost -B and yeah, queries and persistence, et cetera. Nothing to show just yet, but I think that will definitely come up in two weeks. Um, so stay tuned and see you then. Have a great and wonderful local time, as Frederick always says. Bye, Take care, everybody. Bye bye.